Sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower, and retell it in words and in touch it is lovely, until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. Galway Cannell once stated in an interview with Elizabeth Lund, it's the poet's job to figure out what's happening within oneself, to figure out the connection between the self and the world, and to get it down in words that have a certain shape, that have a chance of lasting. In Maya Angelou's autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, she says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. As a librarian, many books pass through my hands, and often, due to my insatiable curiosity and hunger for words, they pass under my eyes as well. When I first wandered across Cannell's book, Selected Poems, I knew that I had struck gold. I opened up to the poem, St. Francis and the Sow, and thought, if Cannell's poetry was somehow the last to survive on earth, I'd be more than okay with that. After reading it, I couldn't figure out why a poem about a pig made me feel so beautiful inside. I hadn't even known that I needed to be retaught my own loveliness until reading how delicately, how tenderly Cannell phrased it in St. Francis and the Sow. The bud, he writes, stands for all things, even for those things that don't flower, for everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch it is lovely, until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch blessings of earth on the sow, and the sow began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail. From the hard spininess spiked out from the spine down through the great broken heart to the sheer blue milken dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the fourteen teats into the fourteen mouths sucking and blowing beneath them the long perfect loveliness of Sal. Though many of Cannell's poems dwell in the natural world, he does not consider himself a nature poet. Robert Langbaum said of Cannell in American Poetry Review, at a time when so many poets are content to be skillful and trivial, he speaks with a big voice about the whole of life. Cannell told the Los Angeles Times, I've tried to carry my poetry as far as I could, to dwell on the ugly as fully and as long as I could stomach it. Because I think if you are ever going to find any kind of truth to poetry, it has to be based on all of experience rather than on a narrow segment of cheerful events. This dwelling on the ugly and the terrifying yet exhilarating mortality of humanity can be seen threaded throughout his work. In Cannell's Book of Nightmares, he writes of this desire for permanence humans sometimes have in his poem, Little Sleep's Head Sprouting Hair in the Moonlight. You scream, waking from a nightmare. When I sleepwalk into your room and pick you up and hold you up in the moonlight, you cling to me hard, as if clinging could save us. I think you think I will never die. I think I exude to you the permanence of smoke or stars even as my broken arms heal themselves around you. You can almost tangibly feel the friction of opposites in these lines, of immortality and mortality, of death and the eternal burning of the stars. But Cannell's ideas are doing more than just rubbing against one another. They look audaciously into each other's eyes and embrace. Zimmerman's book, Intricate and Simple Things, The Poetry of Galway Cannell, he writes insightfully, Cannell has always held in tension, isolation and belonging, division and wholeness, two sticks rubbed together to start the fire of his poems. But to a greater extent, 
they now play with rather than against each other. Indeed, there is a defining courage in Canel's poetry that is impossible not to notice. And when I say courage, I do not mean he writes without fear. Rather, he seems only to have made a friend of fear. He goes out on walks with it, listening intently to all that his dear, timid friend has to say. He acknowledges his friend's concerns and consoles him with words that lets his friend know all of his fears are valid. But Canel does not stop there. He then proceeds to marry his fear with the divine, transforming it into song. In his book, Body Rags, this musicality of emotion can be detected most clearly in the last stanza of his poem, Last Songs. Silence, ashes in the grate. Whatever it is that keeps us from heaven, sloth, wrath, greed, fear, could we only reinvent it on earth as song? Reinvention and resurrection are weaved throughout Canel's work and play a large role in the powerful and lasting impact of his poetry. This idea of becoming something new and of rising up from the ashes of our past is one that resonates with a good majority of people. If Canel was indeed writing to people on their deathbeds, his poetry would in no way enrage by its triviality, to quote Annie Dillard. Rather, his words are more likely to heal, resurrect, and rub against a damp pile of forgotten twigs in a person's soul and create a spark. The most passionate attempt at resurrection I've seen in Canel's work is his poem, Wait. In Joyce Dyer's essay, The Music of Galloway Canel's Mortal Acts, Mortal Words, she talks of how the poem urges our trust in the world, in both its happiness and sorrow. Canel believes that if we try to survive agony and express gratitude for the chance, we will be less empty. Waiting is much easier said than done, but Canel commands it of us anyway. He knows that life is a process, a continual burning of being reduced to ashes and then built up again into a fire that burns brighter, hotter, and stronger than before. I wrote this poem for a student who was thinking about suicide due to a love affair gone wrong. It's called Wait. Wait for now. Distrust everything if you have to, but trust the hours. Haven't they carried you everywhere up to now? Personal events will become interesting again. Hair will become interesting. Pain will become interesting. Buds that open out of season will become interesting. Second-hand gloves will become lovely again. Their memories are what give them the need for other hands. And the desolation of lovers is the same. That enormous emptiness carved out of such tiny beings as we are asks to be filled. The need for the new love is faithfulness to the old. Wait, don't go too early. You're tired, but everyone's tired. But no one is tired enough. Only wait a little and listen. Music of hair, music of pain, music of looms weaving all their loves again. Be there to hear it. It will be the only time. Most of all to hear the flute of your whole existence, rehearsed by the sorrows, play itself into total exhaustion. If the poet's job, according to Canel, is to figure out what's happening within oneself, to figure out the connection between the self and the world, and to get it down in words that have a certain shape, that have a chance of lasting, then Canel has exceeded even his own standards. His poetry not only has a chance of lasting, but even more importantly, has the potential to transform lives and resurrect hearts, to awaken souls to the joy that can be found in life, even in the midst of suffering. And then of course, because Canel does not rub one stick without rubbing the other, he awakens us also to the sadness that can be found in joy. From his book, What a Kingdom It Was, he leaves the readers as I now leave you with this last stanza in his poem, First Song. It was now fine music the frogs and the boys did in the towering Illinois twilight make, and into dark in spite of a shoulder's ache, a boy's hunched body loved out of a stock, the first song of his happiness, and the song woke his heart with the darkness and into the sadness of joy. <laughs>